I'm Carl Eisenberg, the president of the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society. Along with co-sponsor the Chudnow Museum of Yesteryear, we welcome you to this evening's program. The Wisconsin Marine Historical Society was founded in 1959 and is headquartered in the Milwaukee Central Library on Wisconsin Avenue. We are a nonprofit corporation with 150 members and 20 active volunteers. The society is affiliated with the Milwaukee Public Library and the Wisconsin Historical Society. We are not a museum. Rather, we collect, preserve, and archive materials related to Great Lakes Marine history. Our Great Lakes Marine collection contains over 11,000 vessel files, 32,000 vessel index cards, 50,000 photographs and graphic images, books, nautical charts, journals, manuscripts, newspaper stories, records of shipwrecks and storms, and records of lighthouses. We publish a newsletter and maintain a presence on Facebook and YouTube. November is a special month on the Great Lakes because of the November gales, also known as Witches of November. These ferocious storms sometimes contain hurricane force winds and generate 50-foot waves. There have been at least 25 of these killer storms since 1847. This evening's speaker, Anna Lardnoy, a member of the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society, is an entertaining storyteller, <coughs> neither an expert on boats nor a sailor. The focus of her fun and entertaining stories is on the human dramas that unfold on ships and the legends and folk tales that follow in the wake of disasters. Representing the Chudnow Museum of yesteryear is curator Joel Willems. Joel? Hi, thank you, Carl. I'm here in our uh, speakeasy exhibit, a uh, very popular exhibit at our museum at 839 North 11th Street. And we have quite a number of things, as you can see behind me here on uh, Captain Paps. So um, he was a captain on the Great Lakes and married into the Paps Brewery family. And um, well, uh, really it's made uh, probably the famous, most famous captain here in Milwaukee then. We have a number of things um, in the collection, including this pre-prohibition Paps beer bottle. Um, very small, it's only about eight ounces. Um, it's got a cork for the top and this would have been wired then at the top. So we are currently open um, Friday, Saturday and Sundays. And you can check out more on our Facebook page or on um, our website. And next I'll go to Anna, thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Anna Lardnoy and I am extremely excited to be with you tonight. Thank you so much, Carl and Joel for having me with you tonight. I am really eager to tell you some of my very favorite tales which are maritime disasters. So without any further ado, let me just get right into it. I have written a number of books and if you've heard of my name, it's probably because you know that I am best known for my ghost stories. So tonight we're going to be weaving in these ghostly tales with maritime disasters. And you might be wondering why they would ask me to do this because I'm not a sailor, I'm not an expert on boats, I'm none of those things, but I am a keen storyteller who really loves the drama that plays out on the lakes. I have loved the lakes my entire life. As a kid, I was always loved water and I was just so fascinated by the power of it. And I find something almost magical about being on the lake. So I've always been attracted to it. And when I was very young, the song, the Edmund Fitzgerald came out uh, on the radio sometime in the seventies. And I just remember spending hours of time listening to that, trying to memorize it, looking at a ship in a bottle that we had at home and just letting my imagination take over. And it never stopped. So I, I fell in love with stories of shipwrecks, particularly the supernatural aspect of that. 
And on my recently released book, Storied in Scandalous Wisconsin, which came out in October, there is a chapter of maritime disasters that have a scandal or something that was a little bit just different about them. And because of that chapter, the publisher was putting out a collection of shipwreck books and wanted to know if I wanted to do the Great Lakes. And that has actually long been a dream of mine. So I was thrilled to be able to do it. And it was so wonderful that I was able to connect with uh, the Wisconsin Marine Historical Society. If you have not had the opportunity to go to the Milwaukee Public Library and see the amazing resources they have, I strongly encourage you to do that. It is just a tre treasure trove of information and everyone could not be nicer or more helpful. If there's something you want to know, I bet you're going to find it there. So that's my background. Uh, what I'm hoping happens tonight is that you expert sailors might have lured someone who's not a sailor to listen to this with you. So maybe you have some grandkids with you or your honey is curled up next to you on the couch. And this is a nice way to introduce them to the world of ships without being a sailor. So in the book, I look at legendary wrecks. And if you've ever taken my Gothic Milwaukee walking tour, you know that I tell a version of the Lady Elgin wreck in that in that tour. And I usually start by telling people it was the second worst maritime disaster that ever occurred on the Great Lakes. And how they calculate that is they really do it. Um, there's all different ways that they rank disasters. But when I'm talking about them and the stories that we'll hear tonight are really about the, the death tolls. So whenever I tell people that the Lady Elgin is the second worst maritime disaster, every single night people ask, well, is the Edmund Fitzgerald first? No, I'm not even close to being first. I think that that has been captured in our imagination largely because of that song. And we know that 29 people died and, and was a terrible tragedy, but a really a small tragedy compared to what happened in Chicago with the Eastland. Over 844 people dead without ever even leaving the dock. All of those people living in a few concentrated neighborhoods. It was a tragedy that, that echoes to this day. And then uh, one that you may not be as familiar with, the J.P. Griffith. That was a terrible tragedy that um, started because of a fire that was on board the ship. And the fire is raging. The captain of the boat is trying desperately to get to shore as quickly as possible, but runs aground. And unfortunately, they run aground over a mile from shore in an area that's too deep. And and it ends up people dying mostly of drowning. And we're going to start our journey of tragedy with a story that has a lot of similarities to that third worst maritime disaster, and even a, a pretty similar body count. It's the story of the SS Phoenix. The SS Phoenix was a propeller steamer. And it was from the, the early days of propeller steamers on the Great Lakes. It was running a route in 1847 that they called up the lakes. And I know you sailors know this route. It's taking the starting in Buffalo and coming down through the lakes and coming into Michigan. And that was a way that they were transporting immigrants 
from Europe into the Midwest, into places like Milwaukee and Minnesota. And it was that kind of a group of people who were on this fateful journey in November of 1847. So they were coming from Buffalo, cargo and many immigrants, some estimate about, about 175 Dutch immigrants were aboard. And they were aboard with every piece of property that they owned in the world. The valuables that they had might have been sewn into the hems of their skirts or cuffs of their jackets. Their trunks carried everything that they would need for the new world. This was it. So they load up on this boat with all of their hopes and dreams, and they're making their way through the lakes. And it's November, and they are meeting storm after storm, and it's just been an exhausting journey for them. And people are feeling battered. The captain is actually, during one of the storms, thrown out of bed, and he is injured so severely that he ends up bedridden for part of this journey. So everyone needs a break by November 20th. And they decide that they're going to take a break in Manitowoc. Their next destination is Sheboygan. They're not far away, but everyone needs a break. So they go into the harbor of Manitowoc. The crew rows into town. They stock up on some more wood for their boilers. Rumor has it they may have hit a few watering holes for some libation. That remains hotly debated. And then they get back to the boat. And sometime around one in the morning on November 21st, the winds die down and they decide to set sail. Most of the people who are on board are fast asleep during this. But as they're traveling, some uh, of the guests on board start waking up and coming to the engine room. It feels like there's something wrong with the boat. It's, it's moving oddly in the water. They continue to get send, sent away from the engine room. A group of men decide they organize, they go down and they're like, let us in. The crew says, no, there's nothing going on here that you need to know about. And one of the passengers was even punched in the, the mouth when he was trying to get in. Well, by four in the morning, the gig was up. What had been happening is a fire was raging on the Phoenix and had been raging for hours in the engine room. The boilers became so overheated, they glowed red hot. And it started the timbers that held these boilers together aflame. And the sailors were trying and trying to put out the fire, but it was a, just a ferocious fire that grew and grew. They couldn't get they couldn't get it out. And by four in the morning, they realize it's out of control and they need to abandon the ship. So alarm bells go off, warnings are called, and all of these blurry eyed people are coming out of their rooms to the, the clanging of this alarm. And they're a little confused because many of them don't speak English. But they eventually catch on as the flames are climbing and the black smoke is billowing out. It's time to evacuate the boat. Well, there are only two lifeboats that are on the, with Phoenix. The Phoenix that holds about 300 people. It only gets worse from there. The lifeboats only carry 20 people, but they were able to squeeze 23 onto one of them. One of them was the captain who had been injured and they send them sailing away. So 43 people sail away from the Phoenix that is aflame. 
And the remainder of those 200 and some people are in the flaming ship and they're not sure what to do. The water is icy cold. They face death if they jump in and they face death if they stay on board. And at first people put all of their hopes into someone coming to rescue them. But as they wait, the flames climb higher and higher. People frantically begin to throw anything that floats into the water and try to jump on it to save themselves. One survivor remembers seeing a young cabin boy frozen to a ladder bobbing in the water. Another lady was lucky enough to throw a lounge chair into the water. She was able to jump on it from the boat, but because she was so overcome with the emotion of the moment, she faints and slides off that lounge chair into the icy waters and never comes up again. Well, those who were too afraid to jump into the water started climbing the, the poles of the ship. There was one man who chained himself to the mast of the ship, yet he, overcome by flames and smoke, dies there, really being barbecued in the flames. Others are climbing up the riggings, but the higher they climb, the flames just follow them up. And as people are starting to realize that there's not going to be a salvation. Pandemonium eventually happens on the ship. Some people become hysterical. Others quietly resign to the fact that they're going to die. And some just begin to pray harder. There's a terrible tale of two young sisters, both under 10, by themselves, they look around, they see the situation, they grab each other's hands and walk off the flaming deck into the icy water, forever entwined together. The flames are burning so hotly that people on land are waking up because the night sky is lit up with the flame. And they're coming out onto the beaches to watch this disaster happen. Well, the wind has died down considerably and people don't have the, the ability to sail directly to that lake. So the Delaware is, is in the harbor and they're firing up their boilers to try to get the momentum to get out there. And in that time, the 43 people arrive on the beach and they see in horror what is happening to everyone they know in the United States, everything they own. It's, it's there and it's on fire. The Delaware finally gets out to, to the boat and they're horrified by what they see. Of the maybe 250 people who were left there, only three remain. And they pluck those three people out of the water and they tow in basically the hull of the ship. It has burned down to the water line at this point. And in the water are the bobbing corpses of those who didn't make it. The three survivors join the 43 that made it into the lifeboats on the beach. And they are all stunned into silence. Sheboygan rallies around them. The townspeople make sure that these, that these 46 people have clothing, have a place to stay, are able to get to the next place. But it, it leaves them scarred. The next morning, the Delaware sails back out and goes past the, 
the spot where the phoenix burned to the waterline. And in the morning light, they see the field of corpses bobbing in the water. And the captain decides to continue to sail by. He does not pluck these people from the water. And suspicious members of the crew believe that this action curses the Delaware. That it was their obligation to take those people out of the water and deliver them home. And since they didn't, the ship was cursed. And there may be some truth to that. There may be just coincidence. But in November of 1855, the Delaware herself sinks, taking all 11 on board with her. Now, we don't know whether those bodies were reunited with their loved ones or whether they were left in the icy depths. But it is something that the superstitious are always concerned about. Now, the things that happen next are how I became interested in the Phoenix. In the days after the sinking or the burning sinking of the ship, corpses started washing up on the beach in Sheboygan into an area that is, is now a park. And these bodies had everything valuable that the people who, who were once alive had on them. So people started looting those bodies and charred currency started becoming part of the, the circulated currency in Sheboygan. And some people said that those, those charred dollars resulted in bad luck for the people who spent them. Once the bodies were taken care of, many people believe that the spirits of those people who were so, so close to land and never made it, continued to try to get to land. Some people say that they see strange shapes in the waves at night. And some people attribute those strange shapes to ghostly bodies still trying to wash up to shore. They say that there are a number of cold spots in that park where those bodies landed. People have had strange supernatural experiences in it. And right next door is a yacht club. And you may have been to that yacht club. Legend has it that one of the men who never made it off the boat that night continues to linger in the basement of the yacht club. They say there are lights that go on and off without any human intervention, cold spots in that basement. It's the sailor, the sailor from the Phoenix, still longing for shore. I have to imagine that a similar type of thing must have happened to those people who were on the Griffith. We'll never know exactly how many people died in that tragic fire. There, the best estimate is around 250. Captain Sweet to his dying day felt that that was just too high. His guilt might not have let him realize how many people were on board. A terrible tragedy that happens again and again until legislation is passed that ensures that there are the right number of lifeboats to the number of passengers on board. But that's going to take decades and decades. Let's move on to something that happens in Lake Superior that you probably have heard of. When I started discovering maritime disasters, the Western Reserve um, it is one of the first ones that I encountered. And that's because it, it was in a collection called Ghost Ships, which was absolutely not what I thought it was. Because <laughs> 
I, as a ghost enthusiast, I was thinking ghost ships were something entirely different than they are. Um, for those people who are listening to this that are brand new to, to these type of stories, a ghost ship, not a ship that is inhabited by ghosts, which would be very cool, but rather a ship that has sunk, but people still claim to see it sailing. And this is one of those ships. So it starts off in an enchanted way. It was a big and fast ship. It was one of the first modern metal ship, steel rather, modern steel ships on the lakes. And it was owned by a, a millionaire who happened to be a really good sailor. And he was going to take this ship from Erie to Lake Superior. And they, he, he was going to make a an outing of it. He brought his wife. He brought his sister-in-law. He brought his kids, Charlie, who was 10, his little daughter, Florence, who was six, and his niece, Bertha, who was nine. They joined a crew of 21. And they were all setting sail. Their, their end destination was they were going to Minnesota to pick up some ore. So they were actually moving through the lakes pretty quickly because this freighter was empty on the way out. And it was August. It should have been easy and idyllic for them, a great adventure for the kids, a nice time for everyone. But it wasn't because it's, it's in this collection. So a rare August gale comes blowing in. And the ship was being absolutely battered by heavy northwest winds. They made the decision to try to get into the lake because the owner of the boat, Peter Minch, felt that a boat this big and sturdy could absolutely handle this type of weather. But he was wrong. After hours of being pummeled by the ship, they heard this tremendous crashing. And when they ran to see what it was, they saw that the ship was actually tearing in half. Just before the boilers, it was breaking and snapping. As it's pulling apart, water is rushing in. And the crews immediately start lowering the lifeboats into the, the turbulent waves. And even though they're in the middle of a, a terrifying experience, everyone is calmly boarding the lifeboats. There are enough lifeboats for everyone aboard. The whole family gets into the wooden lifeboat and a few of the crew are in there as well. And the remainder, remaining crew members all get into a smaller metal lifeboat. And as they both try to move away from the ship, the wooden boat capsizes. And the, the people in the metal ship are stunned and horrified. They try to paddle as, as quickly as they can through the storm waves. And they get close to that boat, hoping that someone's going to pop up from between the waves but they don't see little Florence, the six-year-old. They don't see little Bertha. They see just a few men. And one of them is Harry Stewart, the wheelman. They pull him on and they begin now with an even smaller group of people and they're making this 60 mile journey to shore. The the boat is dangerously overweight now. It's just about a foot above the water line because it's, you know, packed with all the people that, that they could manage to get on this because one of their ships have capsized. And they are trying all night just to keep the storm from getting into this, this small ship. And they're bailing. They're taking turns bailing. One man is using his his hat and others using his shoe and 
they do this all night. And then they see a red light, like a, like a beacon from heaven. Another freighter is passing by. Well, they're just in this little lifeboat. They don't have any lights. They don't have any way of signaling. So they muster all their strength and they start to shout at this freighter, hey, please come and help us. They can't be heard over the waves and the wind and they're so small. And so then in an act of desperation, one of the women who are on this lifeboat takes off her shawl and they try to light it on fire just to get something in the dark. But that shawl, like everything else on this tiny boat, is absolutely waterlogged. They watch that freighter sail on and it's like their dreams sailed with it. So by seven the next morning, they're cold, they're exhausted, they are almost at their end, but the two women are still alive. They're wearing life jackets. They're holding their little children and they see, sure, I have to imagine when they see that land on the horizon, they might start to breathe a little easier thinking, we're so close. It's almost there. We can do this. They start making their way towards shore and then the unthinkable happens again. The boat capsizes. And this time, only one person resurfaces. So of those 30 people that were originally on the Western Reserve, now there's only one. And this 24-year-old wheel man is so exhausted that he just hangs onto this life preserver and it takes him two hours to make it the estimated one mile to shore. And once he gets on the shore, he realizes his journey is far from over. He now has to hike another 10 miles to get to the rescue station to get help. And he summons the courage and the strength. And he starts to tear through these woods. And he finally makes it to the Deer Park Life Saving Station. He is bloodied, battered, exhausted when he gets there. He knocks on the door, of course welcomed in, and he begins to tell his story. And this, he tells it to one of the rescuers named Benjamin Trudell. And as Trudell is listening to this story, his face goes white. It's not because of the horrors that the wheelman had to go through. It's because Benjamin Trudell had this dream the night before. The night before when he went to bed, he slept fitfully and woke up in a panic thinking that there had been a shipwreck. And he actually goes and contacts other men who are working in the rescue station and tells them about this dream. And they're like, no, there's, there's nothing on the radar. Everything is fine. There's not been a shipwreck. It must have been a dream. Just go back to sleep. But it was an incredibly vivid dream. And he could not sleep restfully for the rest of the night. So as he's listening to this story, it's all coming back to him. And he is shocked and terrified. The men of the rescue station follow the wheel man back to the beach where they find the second lifeboat that was overturned. It's empty. As they continue to walk down the beach, they see bodies on the beach. And according to Benjamin Trudeau, he recognized the body of Peter Minch 
before he was even turned over because he had dreamed of Peter Minch's death. Sometimes when Benjamin Trudell would tell this story, he would add in a detail that's chilling to this day. He would tell people that when he turned the body over to, to see who it was, that Peter Minch's hand fell into his, mimicking the handshake that they had shared in the dream. What couldn't be disputed even by the other men in the Deer Park Station was the watch that Peter Minch was wearing when he was found was the same watch that Benjamin Trudell had described in his dream. Benjamin Trudell went on to sail for the remainder of his days and tell this story for the remainder of his days. But that's not where the intrigue of this ship ends. Many people wonder why a ship like this could have possibly torn in half until its sister ship met the exact same fate in the exact same conditions. And it was discovered that those ships were probably made of brittle metal, which caused them to, or brittle steel rather, that caused them to break apart. But this ship that met, met, is a ship, many people claim, that they see still sailing on Lake Superior, sometimes drifting in and out of fog, particularly people near the Deer Park Station will claim that they will see this massive ship and they will hear sounds of laughter, conversation almost like a party of the Gilded Age, one that very well could have been happening on that ship when she sailed. Coming from this sh the vision of the ship and then disappearing back into the fog. People still claim that they see her to this day. And she is just one of a fleet of ships that have earned the nickname of the Flying Dutchman. And when you start to look at ghost ships, you'll find that tales of, of ships that continue to sail after they have sunk can be found all the way back to the stories of ancient Greece. This is a motif that, that continues, and it could be because humans don't like unfinished business, or it could be because there's some truth to these stories. It's up to you to decide. Let's see what's next. The Ironsides. This is a very Milwaukee story. You might be familiar with this story. It has a, a lot of interesting parts and a modern connection. So it's a story that I really enjoy telling. When the Ironsides launched back in 1864, she was an elegant ship. She was a passenger liner. She was doing runs between Milwaukee and Grand Haven and all around the lake. And just to kind of give you a sense of how elegant she was, this was 1864 and there was hot and cold running water on the ship. And that's something that a lot of houses in Milwaukee didn't even have. There was marble, there was mahogany, there were chandeliers, it had it all on the surface. But the owner of the boat, they like to cut a lot of corners. And word on the street was that this boat was in bad repair. That it really needed to have a whole new hull and a replaced bottom. But the owners were like, eh, we can get away with some caulking and paint. Mm -hmm. But maybe they really couldn't. Because as 1873 continued, Cargo was getting wetter and wetter after every run and to the point where the crew would wait until dark to unload so people could not see how wet the cargo was. Rather than repairing the ship, the owners 
started paying a premium for crew members to ride on the ship that many people thought was just no longer seaworthy. You know, you have a lot of young men with not a lot of opportunities to climb aboard for a premium. They think, I'll just do it one more time, one more run. I'll make this, this big money and then I'll, I'll get away. That's what a lot of them thought. And that is probably what was in their mind the summer of 1873 when they're making another run to Grand Haven. And on, on the ship were many people, and one of them was part of the Valentine family. Henry Valentine actually worked for the company who owned this ship. And in his mind, this was one of the most elegant, safe, and fantastic boats on the lakes. And he bought his wife and his, inf not infant, but toddler son, passage on this boat. They are going to go on a lovely summer getaway. His, this little boy's first time on a ship. His family dresses him in a little blue sailor suit. He's probably around three or four. And all accounts say that he might be one of the most adorable children that you've seen. And he wowed the crowds on the boat. Every, everywhere he went, People would turn around and coo over him. His dad was taking him around the ship, getting to know things, maybe seeing the wheelhouse. It was a wonderful time for the family. But when the bell blew, dad had to get off the ship. It was 10 o'clock. They were going to set sail. And he stayed on that pier and waved to that ship and that little boy that made him so incredibly proud until they were well out of sight. But he knew that they were going to be safe because they were on one of the best ships. And of course, he bought his wife and his son a stateroom so they could rest together. And they slept through the night. But again, the gale comes. And the winds are howling, the waves are rolling, and this ship is twisting and turning in the waves. And each time it does, the leaks spring a little more and a little more. The pumps are going all night. But by morning, they're knee deep. And the storm is only getting worse. By 9 a.m., the engine was flooded and the captain realized it was time to get into the lifeboats and get rescued. There were plenty of lifeboats on this boat. There might have almost been too many lifeboats on this boat. And I'll tell you why I say that in a bit. By 11 a.m., everyone's in lifeboats, but the waves are quite high. And these are big lifeboats and they need a lot more weight so that they're not tossed in the waves. But we have lifeboats leaving with five people. It's just, they're too light, they're too flimsy, and they're no contest against the eight to 12 foot waves that are just barreling over this ship. These little lifeboats are tossed in the waves, often capsizing, and every time they do, fewer people get back on. And in the end, only two of the five boats make it to shore. Among those lost in the waves were the captain, Nettie Valentine, and that, of course, that beloved little Henry in his blue sailor suit. 20 people drown in the pursuit of land. So when this storm passes, they go back and they collect the bodies of those that didn't make it. They're all wearing their life preservers. So they're easy to pluck out of the water. Mother Valentine, her corpse is rolling in the waves and they pull her in, but they don't see little Henry. And these men are reluctant to leave this little boy 
to the elements and they search and search and they finally find him. He's half buried underneath the sand, but when they look at him, they can't believe it. There's not a scratch on him. He is completely unmarred. They say he looks angelic, almost like he's sleeping. They bring him aboard when they finally discover him and they nail Nellie and her son into a pine box and, and send them back to Milwaukee. There's always confusion about who dies aboard these ships. So Henry Valentine is in Milwaukee waiting for the ship to return, hoping that there's been a mistake, that his family will come running into his arms when the boat docks. But instead, he picked up the box and he takes their bodies and they're buried here in Milwaukee. Their funeral service was <clears throat> at St. John's in Cathedral Square. That should be the end of the story, but that would be a terrible ghost story, wouldn't it? <laughs> this and terrible tale comes up again in the summer of 2000. In the summer of 2000, there's a Coast Guard festival that is near Grand Haven. And <clears throat> the Mackinac is out there doing some demonstrations and they report hearing the cries for help from a young boy. So they can't immediately see anything. It's extremely heavy haze around them. They send out rescue boats to look for this little boy. No one can find anything. They co start contacting boats that are in the area saying, do you have any distress? Is there a child that's missing? They can't find anything. Well, these are Coast Guard people. They're not foolish people who are, you know, telling ghost stories with candles like me. They're military people who know their stuff and they really go out of their way. They're convinced that they hear this and they don't want to let it rest because they're really worried someone needs help. Well, nothing comes of it, but they can't let it go. And as they're investigating the area, they discover that the Mackinac was right by the Ironsides' final location where it sunk. And the only child that died in that area was little Henry Valentine. And many people believe what they heard that day wasn't a strange echo. It wasn't a little child making a prank. It was little Henry Valentine looking for a way out of the cold water, calling for help that never came for him in 1873. As we sail into the holidays, I have a feeling that you knew that I was going to uh, give you this very, very famous story. Because how could I kick off the holiday season if not talking about the Rao Simmons? And for those of you who aren't aware of the Rao Simmons, this has a much more familiar common name it is the Christmas tree ship. And I like this story not only because it has Christmas stuff, but it also has a lot of superstition and coincidences. And so if you're uh, an expert sailor and you're listening to this with people who aren't, this will be a really fun thing for you to talk about afterwards because there's a lot of superstitions in here that you might want to explain to your non-mariner friends or me because I think that this is stuff that's really interesting. So we see the Rao Simmons here and she's a three-mast wooden schooner and she sailed for 44 years. They definitely got their money's worth out of her. She was a workhorse and she could tow about three to four hundred tons 
And she was also a leaky ship. And unfortunately, the hardworking owners of the ship did not caulk her that season. But that may or may not have something to do with this. I'll let you decide. So the captain of the boat, which people commonly call Captain Santa, but his real name is Herman Schoenemann, he spent most of his life on the lake. And so he knew that it was a dangerous place to be. And by all accounts, he was a good sailor and a good human. He did a lot of hauling of trees on the lake, but how he became locally famous was he had a Christmas tree stand in Chicago and he sold his Christmas trees that he had gotten from, from up North for between 50 cents and a dollar off the, the Chicago river. But he was known as a kindly man and he would give trees to people who really needed them. that just couldn't afford them. And he would give trees to orphanages. It, Sounds like he was just a very good person. So it's November of 1912, and he is scheduled to leave Chicago. He's on his way to northern Michigan to collect these trees. And we might be saying, no, not November. But Shoneman knows exactly how dangerous the lake is in November. Not only has he been sailing his whole life, but his brother died on the way back from a Christmas tree run in November in 1899. So he knows exactly how, how dangerous this is, but he's going to do it. And he's got a co-captain who is also a partial owner of this boat. And his name is Captain Nelson. He had his doubts about this trip. He knew that the ship was pretty leaky, that they had skipped caulking, the weather had been bad. But he committed to showing him that he would do this and the Christmas trees are so important to him. He was going to honor his commitment. But he told this family this was it. This was this is the last run, last Christmas tree run. And his daughter begged him not to go. Some say she had a premonition that something bad would happen, but he dismissed it. He said, honey, don't worry, I'm going to come back safe. Nothing is going to go wrong. This is my last one. And interestingly, Shoneman also told his family, this is it. This is my last one. So both Nelson and Shoneman get on the boat that November thinking in their hearts, this is my last run. Now, here is where some interesting superstitions come up. It is said that sailors are very superstitious about Fridays. And they don't want to start journeys on Fridays. There's even some accounts of people waiting until a minute after midnight to begin a journey to avoid leaving on a Friday. But the Christmas tree ship left on a Friday. Left on a Friday with 13 people aboard. Double superstition. And they watched a parade of rats climb off the boat and onto shore as, as they were getting ready to leave, which might be a bad sign when the rats are leaving, but there's a, a reason that's not superstition for that. It's because rats can get into those small tight places. And so rats are often the first to know that a ship is leaking. So the rat parade was in effect. They were staying in Chicago, but the 13 men on the Rouse Simmons set sail that Friday. And their trip to Michigan was by all accounts pretty uneventful. But by the time they finally arrived there, they watched another lineup of rats get off the boat. Well, this did not sit well with the sailors. They thought maybe we got here safe, even though we left on a Friday and there's 13 of us and rats. But now these rats are telling us again this is a bad idea. And they watch them load up tree after tree on this boat. They put 5,500 trees on this. Apparently, it looked like a floating forest. 
they, they were piled as high as they possibly could. Well, a few men looked at that and said, no, I am not getting back on there. And that was a really big deal to make that decision because they don't get paid for part of the journey. You either go there and back or you get nothing. So not only did they lose the money from going there, they had to pay to get home. So they're kind of double out money when they make this, this choice. But a few of them just have that feeling that this is going to go poorly. And so they take a train home. But the Rouse Simmons people really don't care because they pick up some lumberjacks up there who need a ride back to Chicago. And no one knows for sure, but maybe between 16 and 23 people were on the Rouse Simmons, Simmons along with those 5,500 trees when they set sail to come back to Chicago. And that's when things go wrong. They end up running into heavy weather. There were 65 mile an hour winds, an extreme temperature drop. They went from rain to heavy snow that clung to the ship. They were battling 40 foot waves. And soon the men, the, the boat, the trees, the ship, everything was covered in ice. They got all the way to Kewaskum and they started sending out a distress signal. And that distress signal could actually be seen from shore. So a gas-powered lifeboat was sent out to rescue the people on the Rao Simmons. And when they got within a thousand feet of the boat, a snow squall came in, swirled around the lifeboat, obscuring their vision. And when it finally cleared, the Rao Simmons was gone. Just gone. And that's how it stayed for many years. Shortly after the boat disappeared, they found a message in a bottle and it was sealed with a piece of pine wood. It washed up in Sheboygan and there was a note inside and the note was thought to be written by Captain Nelson. And he wrote Friday, everyone goodbye. I guess we are all through. During the night, the small boat washed overboard, leaking bad. Invalid and Steve lost too. God help us. And beyond that one bottle, the only other evidence that the ship had ever been there was that Evergreen started washing up on the shore. And people trying to make something good of a bad situation said it, it's Captain Santa. He's still delivering his Christmas trees. And when the trees washed up but were no longer green, the townspeople would still harvest that wood and make Christmas ornaments out of it. And then in 1924, somehow, Captain Santa's wallet was discovered in the lake. It was made of a waterproof oil skin. So even though it had, hit, it had been in the water for 12 years, the contents inside were still undamaged. They returned this wallet of Captain Santa's to his wife. And it was noted that the boat that found this wallet, well, that boat was called the Reindeer. And that's how this story stayed until 1971. In 1971, a diver found this mysterious missing ship, the ship that had, had no trace of it for 59 years. That diver discovered that what happened to the Rouse Simmons is that she lost her steering wheel and that's probably why she wasn't able to sail the shore. But he also discovered 
that the ship had a good luck horseshoe that hung on the cabin wall. But one of the nails had come out and it was now hanging down with all of the luck flying out of it. And if there's any truth to that, the luck certainly did. The dive helped solve a mystery about what happened to the ship, but there are still mysteries that remain. Apparently 13 days after, 13, the Rouse Simmons went down. Sailors on the lake claimed to hear the phantom tolling of the Rouse Simmons bell. As you sailors know, that, that tolling of the bell is traditionally to denote a loss of life. And some people say the Rouse Simmons, the ghostly Rouse Simmons, were to tolling for itself and for the dead aboard. And to this day, people still claim to occasionally see ghostly Rouse Simmons sailing Lake Michigan near two rivers. Those who report seeing her say that her sails are ripped to tatters and they're wildly flapping in the wind, even if it's a really calm night. And sightings of the ship increase the closer we get to Christmas. If people see her, they claim to watch her sail away and soon she just disappears into the mist. No bodies have ever been recovered from the wreck. The widow Shoneman, Barbara Shoneman, she did her best to keep the Christmas tree business going, but eventually she has to give it up and she ends up dying in 1933 and she's buried in Chicago. Her husband's body was never recovered, so he's not buried next to her. But what is next to her is a, a plaque that acknowledges him and has a pine tree, a Christmas tree etched into it. And people claim that when you visit this grave, the smell of evergreen surrounds you. Even if, even though there are no fir trees anywhere near that grave. And some people think that's evidence that Captain Santa did somehow get home to his wife. And I like that. So I am going to turn off my PowerPoint right now. And I am going to be delighted to take any questions that you might have of me. If you've, if you had questions during this, I was not able to see them. So this is a perfect time to, whoops, to ask any questions that you have. What I'm going to do is I am just going to look on the, with, Wisconsin Maritime Historical Society's web or Facebook page to see if you have any questions for me. And if you do, boom, I'm excited to, to take them. If you don't, I want to tell you how much I genuinely appreciate you spending this time with me. And I hope that this was very, very fun for you. And if it wasn't fun for you, let's just never speak of it again. No one really needs to know. I think I'm funny. Okay, so I am on I am on the website. If you have questions, just pop them right in there. Well, Carl, I don't know that we have any questions. Anna, thank you very much for a really entertaining presentation. I surely hope that it was. And I hope that this allows people who are not um, sailing professionals, like I know so many of you really are experts, to enjoy the magic of these stories and all the great resources that Wisconsin Marine Historical Society has. They're a great bunch of people. If you have any interest in um, 
marine history, the Great Lakes, these are the people you need to connect with. Thank you very much. And I wish you a happy Thanksgiving. Thank you all. Take good care. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.